I'm Paul Levinson, and this is Light On, Light Through, episode 29, The Tudors and Rome, Golden Ages on Television. Well, I've been talking for a couple of years about the new golden age of television. The first golden age was back in the 1950s with I Love Lucy, The Twilight Zone, Playhouse 90, and there were certainly good shows on television in the decades since the 1950s. But beginning just a few years ago, something very interesting happened on television. I think we saw it first with The Sopranos on HBO. It was the kind of show that was more than just a, a series. Somehow the combination of, of the acting, of the, of the script of the intensity of the drama, I think, and many other people have noted this as well, created something that we had never before seen on television. In many ways, what it did, what The Sopranos did, is made television a kind of motion picture, except rather than seeing a show in two and a half or three hours or an hour and a half, in the case of The Sopranos and any series on television, we saw it on a weekly basis. And The Sopranos, of course, will start its concluding series of episodes sometime uh, next week, and it'll be very exciting to see how The Sopranos concludes. Well, one of the things that has also happened in this new golden age of television has been a different kind of content. Now, part of the new golden age of television has been a continuation of, of spy programs. For example, Alias at its best, I think, has been part of this new golden age of television. Certainly, 24 has been an excellent example. But something that we also hadn't seen too often on television uh, began on HBO a few years ago with Rome. This was a series that ran for two years on HBO. It just concluded a few weeks ago. And... Now, having started just a few days ago on Showtime, we have The Tudors. Now, I saw the first two episodes of The Tudors a few nights ago on Showtime's On Demand, and I enjoyed them immensely. The time of Henry VIII, which was the early to mid-1500s, was a mixture of medieval culture and threads surprisingly like ours. Even the way people dressed, you see sort of a combination of very old and very new clothing. There was one scene with Henry VIII where he was wearing what almost looked like the kind of suit a man would wear today at some kind of, maybe not just walking down the street, but for some kind of special party or occasion. And in the time of Henry VIII, men of the court still jousted in armor, when they weren't playing indoor tennis. And, of course, the jousting in armor is medieval, and tennis is something which we associate with our own modern world. So the Tudors has them both, along with great historical characters, superb acting, and scenes so colorful you can almost taste the luscious fruit in some of those scenes. This is also a time of really great historical figures, Thomas Moore of Utopia fame is here. His is one of the most fascinating stories. Uh, Starts out a very loyal supporter of Henry VIII, and we'll see what happens as the series develops. Eventually, Thomas can no longer support Henry, and he's put to death. But so far, things are very good between uh, Thomas Moore and Henry. In fact, he and Henry discuss Machiavelli's new treatise, The Prince, in one of the scenes in the first two shows. Cardinal Woolsey, played perfectly by Sam Neill, is plotting to become Pope and mentions the heretic Martin Luther. Now, I'm especially fond of these times and people because I teach them in my Introduction to Communication and Media Studies classes at Fordham University, uh, and I write about them in books like The Soft Edge, A Natural History and Future of the Information Revolution. These were times that were very much moved by media the printing press introduced into Europe just 50 years earlier, will put teeth 
into Martin Luther's exhortation that people should read the Bible for themselves and not rely so much on the interpretations and teachings of the church. And of course, prior to the printing press, there weren't enough Bibles around for this kind of advice to have worked or to have been meaningful. So, the Protestant Reformation is about to happen, and with that, the scientific revolution, the rise of public education, the rise of national states, all of these things were stimulated by the printing press, and Henry is right there to take full advantage of them. The Sex and the Tudors is also great, and that's part of what drives Henry. The sex on Rome was spectacular also, and I think one of the keys to both Rome and the Tudors being successful is the wonderful way in which they depict sex. And I mean that literally. Why am I saying wonderful? Because there's really nothing sleazy about it. It's just people enjoying themselves. There's something very realistic about it and very uh, attractive and appealing. In one of the early episodes of Rome, we saw Polly Walker, completely naked, playing Atia, and it was both attractive and natural in terms of the history, in terms of what people did and how they comported themselves in Rome. And the same is true of the Tudors. Jonathan Rhys Myers, who played the lead in Woody Allen's Match Point, gives a commanding performance as King Henry VIII. And we haven't seen that much yet of Anne Boleyn, except just to uh, see a few scenes with her. She certainly looks tempting. She's played by Natalie Dormer. Now, comparisons to HBO's Rome uh, are irresistible. I was delighted to notice that the first scene in The Tudors has Henry's uncle, in quotes, murdered in Rome in what could almost have been the same place as Julius Caesar. Delighted because it was sort of fun to see this nod in the Tudors to HBO's Rome. Now, unfortunately, the real Henry VIII didn't have an uncle, but neither was Atia in the HBO series, much like the real Atia Balba, and that didn't hurt HBO's Rome one bit. And so in the history, really, of, of the docudrama, we do see some either fictional characters or some things happening with the real historical characters, which may not be completely accurate. But I think that's okay. And the fact is, most historians will acknowledge that there's a lot that's written in formal nonfiction history which also might not be completely accurate. Obviously, no historian will deliberately make something up, but the truth of the matter is historians rely on other historians, and sometimes these other historians might not have been all that accurate. So, mixing in drama into an historical sequence is something which has always been part of history, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it on television. Now, there are some significant differences uh, between the Tudors and Rome. Mainly, the Tudors has no fictional downstairs to its upstairs the way Rome did. No Vorinus and Pullo with their powerful counterstory intertwining with real history. The Tudors is all upper crust so far, all nobility. But at this point, I'm thinking that's more than enough to make this a great series, and I'm looking forward to more. The Light on Light Through podcast is proud to be part of the Blueberry Network. That's blueberry with no ease dot com. And now a word from our new sponsor, Go to My PC. You know, things were a lot easier back in the time of the Tudors, at least as far as communication was concerned. All you had was really one medium, the printing press. Nowadays, of course, we have television, computers, all kinds of things. So what do you do when you have some very valuable information that's on your home computer and you're out there traveling somewhere, maybe across town, across the country? 
Use GoToMyPC and you'll discover the power and freedom of the web. Try it free right now for 30 days with unlimited access. For this special offer, just visit GoToMyPC.com forward slash podcast. That's GoToMyPC.com forward slash podcast. You are listening to a Runaway Network podcast from RunawayNetwork.com. Yes, indeed, and the LightOnLightThrough.com podcast is now proud to be part of two networks, the Blueberry Network, which is sweet, and the Runaway Network, which is very edgy. And in fact, you'll find a lot of sweet and edgy stuff in the LightOnLightThrough.com podcast. And this brings us to our edgy flashes section. And we start with the FCC. They're at it again. Did you hear just a few days ago the FCC affirmed the fact that it was continuing its ban on cell phones in planes? Now, just to be clear, if there was any danger whatsoever of people using cell phones and planes causing the plane to crash, causing any kind of problem with the navigation or the equipment or any of the tech stuff that's on the plane, I, of course, as would any sane person, I would be 100% in favor of not allowing cell phones on planes. But you know what? If you look at the FCC statement, they admit that there's no technical evidence. They're not sure what's going on. So why then are they continuing the ban that they started a few years ago? Well, it turns out they've received a lot of complaints. A lot of irate people have written to the FCC saying, we don't like taking a plane somewhere and someone sitting next to us is yapping on the cell phone. That's a reason to ban cell phones on planes? Because some dyspeptic person doesn't like hearing somebody else talking on the cell phone? My advice to those people is, hey, rent a car and drive across the country. That way you don't have to have anybody else sitting next to you. Or if you do have someone sitting next to you, you can insist that they don't talk on the cell phone. You can insist even that they keep their mouths shut. And you'll have no problem, a nice, quiet peaceful ride. But if you're on a plane, you're in a public situation where other people have rights to, you don't like listening to someone talking on the cell phone on a plane, invest in some earplugs. As far as the FCC is concerned, this is exactly what happens when you have an organization that's out of control. And having cracked down on radio stations and television stations, for broadcasting supposedly indecent material, eyeing cable stations like HBO and Showtime. And by the way, if the FCC and Congress have their way, we won't see series like The Sopranos, series like Rome, series like The Tudors on television. Why? Because it has some material that some person somewhere in some part of the country might find objectionable. And they might write a letter to the FCC. That's all the FCC needs to ban that. And now the FCC is turning its unconstitutional attention to cell phones. So I hope people stand up for this. I tell you what, uh, what I'm going to do when I go on a plane next time is maybe I'll play this podcast good and loud so all the people around me can hear it. Hey, you can do the same if you're on a plane and see whether or not those irritating, irritated passengers who don't like to hear voices feel any better about the sound coming from this podcast. Josh Wolf was let out of prison this week. That's wonderful news. However, it was outrageous that he was in prison even one day, let alone over nine months. And we still have an urgent need in this country for a federal shield law. Details about this at paullevinson.net and also look on lightonlightthrough.com. 
But speaking of government, the Supreme Court finally did something right. I don't know if you saw earlier this week or heard, the Supreme Court decided in a very narrow decision, five to four, to insist that the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, do what it can to limit greenhouse gases. Up until this decision, believe it or not, the EPA was ignoring global warming. And now finally the Supreme Court has ordered the EPA to do the right thing. I wonder how many justices on the Supreme Court saw Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. You know, the Supreme Court has come a long way about movies. In 1915, in one of their most infamous decisions, uh, Mutual Film versus the State of Ohio, Justice McKenna, speaking for a majority of the court, said motion pictures are just a business. They have no redeeming quality. They're not entitled to First Amendment protection. They're not a form of the press or a form of expression of public opinion. Well, that finally was reversed. It took decades. And it's good to see the Supreme Court now finally weighing in on the side of sanity and science regarding global warming. Fashion. And finally, on the subject of global warming, I came across a very interesting article a few days ago. A professor from Columbia University uh, here in New York City is suggesting that one way of combating global warming in big cities is to put gardens on the rooftops of skyscrapers. And this is, I think, a really excellent idea. You know, a lot of people, when you talk to them about global warming, one of their first responses is, well, even if it is really happening, what can we do to help? And here's an excellent way of helping, according to this Columbia professor. So who knows, you know, maybe the drifters all those years ago when they sang, Up on the roof, had it right. Hey, you know what that is, baby? Our promo suite. And first and foremost, we have a promo, as always, for the Mike Thinks podcast, the savviest podcast in town when it comes to interesting bits about technologies and their advantages and disadvantages. In one of the last shows, Mike talks about the new HD DVD for children of men. And guess what? You're lucky if it'll play when you bring it home and you put it on your HD DVD player. Why is this? Well, the companies that make these DVDs, the companies that make CDs, the whole world is so concerned about people stealing somebody else's material that what they wind up doing is making it difficult for law-abiding citizens to play the material. It would be great if once and for all do away with every single copy protection scheme in existence. It gets in the way of creativity. It gets in the way of the people's enjoyment of things that they pay for. And you'll also hear a promo for Sean Farrell and his continuing podcast of my 1999 Locus Award winning novel, The Silk Code. And as I think I've mentioned previously, one of the really delightful things about Sean's patio book are he has people doing introductions to each of the chapters. People who I know very well, people who you probably heard of. These range from Daniel Keyes, who wrote, in my opinion, the best short story ever written, Flowers for Algernon, to Corey Doctorow, Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom, to David Hartwell, one of the most eminent editors in science fiction. Plus, Sean gives it a great reading. So go over to Sean's podcast. You'll get the exact details as to where you can hear it on my page, lightonlightthrough.com. And there'll be a link where you can click to get to the patio book of The Silk Code as read by Sean Farrell. So listen, that's it, folks. I had a great time talking to you as always. Sit back. Relax, and I'll see you next time. Check out 
out the Mike Thinks podcast, www.mikethinks.com. News and current events with an opinion. The Mike Thinks podcast. It's the news you missed. www.mikethinks.com. From patiobooks.com. The day started just like any other day. Always does. Until I watched one of my closest friends die. Right in my arms. Nothing I could do. But his death was a beginning, not an end. And now I've been thrust into a timeless conflict of pyromaniac insects and instant mummification. A war within our very genetic makeup. And when the powers of the ancient world collide with modern technology, no one is safe. Not me, and certainly not you. I'm Dr. Phil D'Amato, NYPD Forensics, and the only way to save myself is to solve the mystery of the Silk Code. The Locus Award-winning novel by Paul Levinson comes to life in this free podcast novel. Journey into the ancient world, witness the wonder of ages past, and join Phil D'Amato in a struggle against forces both ruthless and unseen. Visit www.thesilkcode.blogspot.com to learn more about the author and the novel. And subscribe today at patiobooks.com. Join the battle, witness the wonder, or forever be victim to the awe and power of the Silk Code. Phil D'Amato is ready. Are you? Did you walk out of the Matrix and wonder if you're a battery in a jar? Did you walk out of Daredevil and wonder, what is it like to be a bat? Do you and your friends stay up at night debating good and evil in the Star Wars universe? Does the question of life, the universe, and everything intrigue you? Then open your mind and tune into The Sci-Fi Show, thescifishow.com. And that's five with a PH. Do you remember what he looked like? Hey, this is Jake. I do a show called Just Not Right, the podcast. You can find it at notrightpodcast.com. It's funny, fresh, entertaining. I mean, sometimes I'll just take the mic and say, Hey, oh my, you look nice. You are wonderful. Thank you for listening. You are the best. Check it out. There's a segment called Letters from a Utah Nut. It's hilarious. I know you'll love it. I'm writing this letter in regards to your giant D sign located in front of your store. I want to climb it. Please do not climb the sign. Would it be all right if everyone from our company just started singing? Although we enjoy our customers' enthusiasm for our product, it is strange and unusual for large parties to join in chorus in our lobby. Is it okay for me to be using Windex as a cologne? All S.C. Johnson products are extensively evaluated for toxicity and safety. <laughs> Hilarious! Do you remember what he looked like? NotRightPodcast.com See you there. Punk Horror Podcast, coming to you every other week from Punk Horror Press. Featuring The Punk and the Pastor, a movie review show featuring David Giannis and Stacey Campbell, and author Red Fiction, featuring the best in horror and punk fiction. Don't miss it. Subscribe now at www.punkhorror.com. What you just listened to is the opening piece of each and every Two Guys Talking 24, an online radio talk show, a podcast dedicated to the brilliance of the hit Fox show 24. Join Brian and Mike as they talk about the worst days of Jack Bauer's life, only at the Two Guys Talking Podcast Network, available at Two Guys Talking, that's the number two, guystalking.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.